Veterans Minister Mike Freer announced last night that he will be standing down from his role as MP for Finchley and Golders Green after serving the community for more than 30 years. Telling GB News earlier today that an arson attack targeting his constituency office was the final straw. He has previously received death threats after expressing pro-Israeli views, largely in line with his constituency's sizeable Jewish community. And this comes two years after the murder of Sir David Amos by jihadist Ali Harbi Ali, who Mike actually also uh, unwittingly had something to do with as well. Joe Cox was also killed in recent years while simply doing her job. I'm very pleased to say... Mike Freer joins me now. Mike, thank you very much for coming no, to the studio. Thank you for inviting me. Um, firstly, how are you? It's been a busy day and uh, it's been a quite a traumatic experience. It's a, it's a real wrench to walk away from a job that you love, but also a constituency that um, you've become, you know, I live there, it's my home and I regard many of my constituents as friends and um, it is an amazing, amazing place. And to walk away from that um, is really quite, uh, it's quite an emotional um, wrench to think this was a job I loved and but unfortunately I can't do it anymore. Can you talk me through the process because you mentioned about the you know, alleged arson attack etc being the final straw mm. but this has been a really quite vile journey to get to this point so what kind of threats have you had what's that look like? Well like every MP I mean you, you day in day out you get abusive emails you get low level stuff that whether we should accept it but we do it's graffiti you know it's um Things like, you know, I've had, in the past I've had a mock Molotov cocktail left on the office door, meaning we had to evacuate the whole building. I've come out, and, out of my house and found, a, a, you know, a note on my car. Um, where I live is common knowledge, but what I drive is less so. And it's a few weeks after uh, John Mann had had the wheel nuts on his car tampered with. So that all kind of makes you get a bit, you know, what on earth's going on. But I, I've had two run-ins with the organisation that was Muslims Against Crusades and people like Anjum Chowdhury, um, who was behind that organisation, um, been to prison. But online it said, I, I used to do surgery mo in mosques, uh, surgery mosques, so I wanted to go yeah. out and see people. And online there's a picture of me saying, you're not welcome in our, uh, our mosque, let Stephen Timms be appointed reminder it's not very subtle. Well, just for our viewers and listeners who might not remember that. Stephen that Timms, mean? of course, was stabbed um, by a woman who'd been radicalised. Um, thank heavens he survived. So it was a very unsubtle mm. um, saying, we're coming for you as well. And, you... and they did. They came to the mosque, they broke into the surgery, they um, pushed someone out of the way and they basically then started abusing me. And I was moved into the office for my safety until the police could arrive. They came back at the next surgery. Luckily, the police were there but we're demonstrating an abusive outside. So that was the start of it. And you kind of, as MPs, we kind of shrug it off. It's par for the course. It shouldn't be. Um, and then just the routine stuff. And then we had um, Ali Habi Ali, who, when he, he went on, sadly, to kill David, was then obviously arrested. And they went, the police were thorough, went through his phones and found he'd done several recce's on Finchley. And in his That's evidence... That's terrifying, surely. At the time, of course, I was no idea. But, of mm. course, then when I was told, it wasn't that he'd done recce's, but actually... He'd come to Finchley and he told the police he was armed with the intention to harm. Right. And it's only by a stroke of luck that on that Thursday night, Boris, I often joke, Boris saved my life, not many people can say that. Yeah. Um, it moved me from the Whip's office to Exports. So instead of being in Finchley, wow. I came into Westminster. Otherwise, I'd have been in my office that Friday. And that was really when yeah. the rot set in. Do we take... Now, it's important to say that there was this uh, arson attack at your yep. office. We don't yet know the, no. the, the root cause behind that, and so I don't really want to speculate there because Understood. there's also enough to go at, right? So uh, when it comes to the attacks that you've, you've faced, do we take Islamist threats seriously enough, do you think? Well, I don't think it's just... Um... Islamist threats. I don't want to tire a whole community because my local mosque, my North Finchley mosque, mm. were amazing. They were horrified by what had happened. Uh, and that's not a reflection on my local community. But we do have a problem where people, and I think my personal view is it, this is where social media has a, a lot to blame because people get their news from social media that it's kind of unfiltered. And if it's on social media, it must be true. Uh, but the social media companies really don't do enough to take harmful content off. Or when you complain about something that's on there, basically either you don't get an answer to your complaint or, or nothing happens. And so I think there's two parts. One is social media with content that allows people to be 
you know, like indoctrinated. Mm. Um, and I think, and beyond that, slightly broader problem we have is, you know, we do need to do far more to ensure that people in the UK sign up to our British values. You know, I'm, I'm a gay man. That's not mm. a, mm. that was one of the reasons why Muslim Games Crusades also came after me, being mm. pro-Israel and gay in a mosque. That's a whole different story. But it's like, I don't need you to like me. Mm. I don't need you to accept me, but I do need to understand that this is Britain and these are our values. And if you don't like it, well, that's going to be your problem. I don't expect you to come after me. Mm. One thing I was expecting was maybe Rishi Sunak to be a bit more vocal about this. Are you a bit disappointed that he hasn't made more of a statement, do you think? Um, I think it's difficult for, um, for Rishi. I've spoken to him. In fact, I've, I've just... Um, we had an event for the Parliamentary Party, and to be fair, he was absolutely um, effusive about uh, uh, how this is not acceptable. Um, but equally, um, for him, this is obviously a very personal decision. Um, he understands the motivation for my decision. Um, and, in, you know, to be fair to him, he's giving me lots of support, but also giving me a lot of space um, for me to handle it the way I want to handle it. So I wouldn't criticise the Prime Minister for that. OK, all right. And... When we do have a look at this arson attack that, that took place at your um, constituency office, again, we don't know the motives behind that yeah. at the moment, or certainly not uh, publicly. Um, but can you just talk me through it, 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 what happened in terms of what that was like for you? Well, I don't think I can. You know, I, I appreciate that you know, there's a court case going on. Yeah. Uh, two individuals have been arrested. Uh, they're in prison on remand awaiting trial. Uh, and they've not really commented, so... At uh, this stage, we don't know more than that. Yep. Uh, the police and the fire brigade were exemplary in terms of responding. But what it's done is it, for me, it's like, you know, the alarm goes off on Christmas Eve. Oh, here we go, another false alarm. I won't go to the office on my own at night, so Angela and my husband came with me, and then we'd pull up and see the whole area cordoned off and fire engines. And you just stand and watch the, you know, the back of your office burning with a massive police and uh, fire presence. And then you see the damage afterwards and you think, why does someone do this? You know, is it, is it just random? Is it because of me? Mm. And you can't divorce it from what's gone before. So I might be jumping to conclusions. We'll see what the courts are. But from my point of view, mm. it's a pattern of behaviour now. And Angela Marsman quite rightly said, this is enough. This has got to stop. So did it, this decision, was it driven... A bit by your husband as well. I mean, because it must have... But also, I yeah. did want to ask you this, yeah. actually, which is that, you know, this must have had a huge impact. Yeah, it would, yeah. on anyone close to you. You know, if it was my fiancé, for yeah. example, or anything like that, absolutely, I'd be going out of my mind, you know. So what was that like in the home, if you don't mind me asking? It's difficult because, obviously, you know, as MPs, we kind of shrug it off a bit, you know, rightly or wrongly. But we forget the impact, not just actually on our partners, but also on our staff who have to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, they're the ones who answer the phone and open the door. But, you know, when you come home and, you know, your spouse and partner um, is worried about your safety, you know, and after the Ali Habibi Ali incident, um, Angela doesn't like me walking the streets to the tube station. You know, it wants to drive me to the tube. If he even likes me on the tube, I tend to drive to work now. But if I am on the tube, he wants to pick me up. You know, um, it's like, well, you know, what are you doing today? Um, want to know, you know, are you inside? Are you outside? And also, when I do, like many MPs do, what's called supermarket surgery, you know, you stand by the door, you allow people to come and talk to you, um, you know, he'll see me in a stab vest. And yeah. so, yeah, it's been tough on him. Just, just on that, just, just one more with you, if that's all right, which is the stab vest point, the calls for more security... For MPs and what that would look like in practice, I don't know, a personal bodyguard for every MP or, or, or whatever. Where, where are you on that? Because, you know, mm. this, is, this is something to consider now, isn't it, for people? Um, I mean, I, I, lucky is probably the wrong word, but, you know, after the number of incidents, my office is, is a fortress. Uh, so is my home. Um, after the big incident with the guy that went on to call David, my house was kind of uh, ripped apart. But that's fine. But it, actually, where you're more vulnerable is when you're travelling to, you know, to the office, when you're out and about doing your school visits, doing your supermarket services, that's where you're more vulnerable when you're just doing all oh, just doing your shopping. So security is fine, but it doesn't solve the root cause. Mm. So just wrapping us in, you know, a ring of steel, mm. it's just a symptom. What is, what is causing people to feel that MPs are, you know, it's open season on MPs?
that's the issue that needs to be I just addressed. think it's absolutely desperate state of affairs if we've got good people like yourself who feel as though they can't serve a community anymore, then something has gone incredibly, incredibly wrong, and I'm very fearful. But thank you very much no, for coming thank in. Thank you for inviting uh, me. And, and look after yourself, obviously, you. and hopefully we'll stay in touch as well going forward. That's Martin Freer there.